Ian Wilmot and Keith Campbell had shown they could reverse a differentiated cell, then reprogram it. It proved that cells were not fixed in a particular specialized type. So your skin cell could somehow, or the genetic material in that skin cell, could be made to become a liver cell or a, or a uh, hair cell or whatever. Previously, it had been suggested and written by scientists that this was an impossible task. I don't believe anything's impossible. I think some things are improbable. And cloning, in theory, could also produce human embryo stem cells, the sort that can become any cell type in the body. When the cloning breakthroughs were made, Keith Campbell was working at Rosland as a postdoctoral student. Keith now has his own lab at the University of Nottingham, well away from the main campus. You know, in relative countryside, and I, I think it's a great, great aid to thinking, clearing the head. His team still uses nuclear transfer, the only technique to date that's been used for cloning mammals. We're able to take one nucleus from an adult animal and place that into an egg, so we bypass, there's no fertilization. First, a laser cuts through the zone of pellucida, the outer shell of an unfertilized egg, or oocyte. Now they can go after the nucleus, the mother's DNA. He then inserts the needle and is able to actually extract the maternal DNA. The oocyte is then injected with the nucleus, the DNA from an adult cell of another animal. A skin cell or any other cell in the body, which we know contains intact sequences of both the original paternal and maternal DNA. We pick it up and we go back through the hole we've made in the zone of pellucida. And the nucleus from the adult cell is put in contact with the oocyte. Development will only start after one last bit of intervention. The oocyte and the new nucleus sitting there on top, they're now called a couplet, are jolted to life. A DC electric current will cause partial breakdown of the membrane and the oocyte and new nucleus will fuse together. The resulting embryo is grown for about seven days in a dish, then put into a surrogate mother. Many early embryos weren't viable though because the oocyte and the new nucleus, both often called cells, were at different stages of their cell cycle. The understanding that Keith brought to the project was about the mechanisms which control the way in which cells grow and divide, which are very complicated and it's critical to control them. Keith found a way to stop the growth of the cell being transferred to the oocyte. Before the DNA was copied or synthesized, the cell was brought to rest at a place called G0, within gap stage one, where there is less development. You can induce cells to enter this quiescent or G0 state simply by taking away some essential nutrients. In 1997, one year after Dolly, the Roslyn team cloned Polly. She was a transgenic sheep. She'd been given a human gene to show how animals can make what some people lack. Polly produced a blood clotting protein in her milk. Once we've made the founder animals, we just breed them, and it's just a matter of extracting the protein. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, do you want, you want some of this? When I come down here, I'm looking at the quality of the animals. I mean, I'm interested, obviously, in all aspects of the process from when we make them in the lab through the pregnancy to the birth and then through the growth of the animals. We have six mothers and seven lambs. One of the mothers had twins. Most of these animals had two or three embryos put into them. Since the days at Roslyn, Keith has been working on making cloning more efficient. We've increased the frequency of embryos which will develop to live, viable, healthy offspring. We're now at about 20 percent. When we did Dolly, it was about three and a half percent. It was one out of 29. We have some sheep made from adult cell lines, and then we have sheep made from three fetal cell lines. Mice have long been used as models to treat human disease. Sheep, though, are more like humans. At Nottingham University, the sheep cloning program is tied to medical research. 
an animal such as a sheep, there are some similarities in, in a number of areas, and that is why we felt that cloning in sheep uh, was, certainly from animal models situation, could be even perceived as a better model than, than a mouse, for example. Like Ian Wilmot, Keith Campbell traveled a lot because of the attention generated by Dolly. Some of the travel was for an American biomedical company that he later worked for. The company had a base in the States and I was asked to give uh, talks at local schools, the local colleges, even the local churches on, on the implications of cloning. Keith draws a line at cloning people. I'm personally opposed to reproductive cloning because I think there are, there are thousands of children out there at the moment that need adopting anyway. Keith still travels to speak, but he tries to do less of it now. I don't get paid just for going out and giving lectures. I get paid for doing research, teaching students. Four of his PhD students, including Brian Woodward, graduated this year. No matter what problems you've got, he's very approachable. Laid-back guy, very supportive, very helpful. Knows, knows what he's talking about, uh, is willing to share ideas, help you push your ideas. Travelling and lecturing caused Keith to meet his wife, Kathy. We met at a conference where Keith was a speaker. Kathy was there as a representative for a U.S. company that makes lab equipment. They were married four <laughs> years ago, and this year she moved to England. It started to become impossible to conduct our relationship from 3,000 miles apart and conduct two independent professional lives. When there's time, Keith sneaks in some work on a car he's building in his garage. As a younger man, he had to know how to fix cars just to keep them running. It became quite therapeutic. It takes my mind away from science, lets me do something with my hands. The work Wilmot is doing now is based on a breakthrough by Japanese researcher Shinya Yamanaka. Yamanaka had seen the potential of using cloning to produce stem cells for research and human therapies. Nuclear transfer is a very uh, good way to make stem cells from patients' own cells. But technically, it's very challenging. It's very difficult. And it still hasn't actually been done. South Korean researcher Wang Woo-suk was outed as a fraud two years ago for saying he had created human embryo stem cells by cloning when he had not. And Yamanaka says he has qualms about taking embryo stem cells, sometimes known as ES cells, because the embryo is destroyed in the process. He'd seen one through a microscope at a fertility clinic. I did feel that it is a very special cell. It's not just regular cell. You know, I have uh, uh, two daughters, and the differences between my daughters and those human embryos are very small, actually. If human ear cells or human embryo, using human embryos is the only way to save the patients, I would be happy to do that. At the same time, I have to, we have to do our best to uh, 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 avoid such a usage of human embryos. In his work at the University of California in San Francisco and at Kyoto University in Japan, Yamanaka searched for another way to get stem cells. His first breakthrough came two years ago. He found four genes that, when added to the skin cells of adult mice, caused the cells to reverse and become like stem cells again. Genes give instructions to cells so they can produce proteins. Yamanaka called these new cells induced pluripotent cells, or IPS cells. It is a breakthrough in that uh, we only need three or four factors to induce reprogramming. So it's very easy. Every cell in a person's body has DNA unique to that person. Skin cells, blood cells, liver cells, all share the same 20,000 or so genes. During human development in the embryo stage, different genes in different cells get switched on and off in different ways. At that time, the different cell types are created in the body. 
It's called cell programming. Yamanaka thought that if he could find the gene switches responsible for programming stem cells, he could flip those same switches in individual adult cells, like skin cells, and reprogram them so they return to their original stem cell-like stage. But how could he find the right genes out of some 20,000 possibilities? He used mice for his research and made a bold hypothesis. We hypothesized that factors that induce pluripotencies are largely overlapped with factors that maintain pluripotency in mouse ear cells. So based on that hypothesis, we decided to uh, uh, <coughs> start a project in which uh, we try to identify factors that maintain pluripotency in mouse ear cells. Yamanaka put his team to work. Based on his hypothesis and through computer analysis, they found 100 most likely candidates from the pool of some 20,000 genes. Senior team member Kazutoshi Takahashi credits Yamanaka with delegating responsibility to his team so each member can explore his potential. In many other labs, there is one boss and several sub-leaders reporting to the boss. However, such a vertical structure doesn't exist in our lab. Everyone has active interaction directly with Dr. Yamanaka. After more than three years analyzing hundreds of thousands of cells, Yamanaka and his team narrowed the gene pool down to 24 and finally four. He then got these four selected genes to make iPS cells. He took skin cells from an adult mouse, then used a virus as a means to insert the four genes inside the cells. Two weeks later, the skin cells had completely transformed. Probably the most uh, success in my 20 years as a scientist. Less than a year later, Yamanaka and U.S. researcher James Thompson, working independently, made headlines by publishing papers that said four different genes could be used to make human skin cells pluripotent. Now we can generate stem cells directly from patients. And from those iPS cells, we can generate like cardiac cells or neural cells, which have the same set of genes with patients. So those cells should be very, very useful in understanding why and how those patients became sick. Experiments, though, with mice cloned from the iPS cells shortly after the breakthrough in 2006 showed one of the genes, CMYK, was an oncogene. It caused cancer. When we made new mice from those uh, new stem cells, uh, many of those mice developed tumors in their, in their life. Later, Yamanaka found CMYK could be removed and only three genes were needed to reprogram skin cells to become stem cells. So we don't have to use uh, such a, a dangerous gene or a dangerous protein. There are further challenges. The virus used to shuttle the specified four genes into skin cells, called a retrovirus, can mutate a patient's DNA and cause cancer. They may be very useful for research, but you know, for therapy, they've probably got big problems. So we've got to find a way of actually getting, doing it without the viruses, probably. I think it's just a, a, a technical issue. So uh, in other words, it's just a matter of time. So in the near future, I think we or somebody else would identify ways to induce the same stem cells without uh, the usage of retroviruses. viruses. Before you could think of putting cells like this into people, the procedure needs to be modified so that there is no risk of it. And it may be that the kind of basic research we're carrying out can contribute to that. This is Sir Ian Wilmot's lab at the University of Edinburgh's Centre for Regenerative Medicine. He'll use iPS cells in his new research. The ability that uh, Shinya Yamanaka established of being able to treat cells taken from an adult so that they become equivalent to embryo stem cells has completely revolutionized things generally, including 
for us. Wilmot has started work on therapies for ALS, also known as motor neuron disease. It is invariably fatal. It's a very unpleasant disease. Uh, once a person has the symptoms, they'll slowly lose control of their muscles. It has been many decades since I have been out of my wheelchair. Scientist Stephen Hawking has had ALS for 45 years. He's among an estimated 10% of sufferers who survive more than 10 years. Wilmot will turn iPS cells into patients' nerve cells so he can see why they don't work properly. ALS symptoms arise because of degeneration in the nerves that run down the spine. And so you, you can't directly study those and you can't take them from a patient. It's just not possible. So what uh, research workers really want is to have cells which are equivalent to those in, in the patient. This example in animal research shows how a lab rat can move again freely after human stem cells were used to repair a damaged spinal cord. But the world awaits the first human therapeutic use of stem cells, or iPS cells. What the first therapy will be, I wouldn't like to say, and I wouldn't like to put a timeline on that, although obviously the pressure is on to, to get this as quickly as possible.